Welcome everybody to the first AINTIS membership webinar of 2021. We hope you're all keeping well. Uh, we're really excited today to have our first uh, part one of Learning for Change. Um, so this is part of our Communicating Europe initiative project that we're running within AINTIS. So we'll be exploring fake news, anti-racism, democracy, solidarity and critical thinking. And my colleague Derva Lawless, uh, Aintis Head of Advocacy, is going to lead this session. Um, so we'll just wait for a few more people to join us. Um, I'll give a little introduction to uh, my staff members that are here today. Um, so we have myself, Katie O'Rourke, Head of Communications, uh, with my colleague Barry, um, Communication Memberships Officer. We have Emma O'Kane, who's Social Media Officer. Um, Derva, I've already mentioned. Um, We've uh, Sam O'Brien Ollinger, who's our information and policy officer. Uh, we've Aki Sato Suzuki, who's our research officer. We've Kalyan Farron, who's uh, Angel's projects officer. Uh, Laura Lovejoy, um, who's also our uh, research officer. Um, I hope I'm not forgetting anyone there, guys. I'm trying to read through the list. Um, but you're all really welcome today. So just to give a, a couple of quick updates of some of the work that's happening with Angel's. Uh, we're busy planning our Adult Learners Festival 2021, which is going to take place from the 1st to the 5th of March. So we're looking at really creative ways that we can do that in an online context. Uh, we do hope that everyone's keeping well. We know it is extremely challenging times at the moment, and we're hoping that the next 90 minutes will provide a bit of fun, interaction, uh, a place where we can connect and learn something new. Hence why there are so many angel staff joining today, because it's a topic that we're all really interested in. Um, so we very much encourage you to take part. There's going to be lots of uh, air sessions for reflection, breakout rooms, um, and Derbal is going to talk us through some of the main headings. So Derbal, I'll pass over to you uh, to give a presentation. But again, welcome everybody and happy belated new year. I don't know if we can still say that. I know Alwyn's uh, saying happy new year um, into the comment box there, but you're all really welcome. And we look forward to a really engaging session. Thanks so much, Katie. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see everybody again. Um, I know we're all probably exhausted. We're sick of the pandemic. We're sick of level five restrictions, but we're going to try and keep the energy high because I think we could all do with a bit of a lift. Um, so have a bit of fun. Have a bit of crack. That's what we're here for. And today's focus really is about, um, it's more like um, a capacity building session in terms of looking at what we can do to give people practical steps around these really important areas. Um, and as Katie said, it's taken from a project. Sorry, I'm trying to share my screen here. Love the wonders of IT. Here we go back to online delivery. Um, so it's part of the Communicating Europe Initiative project. Um, many of you may know they put out a call every year and it's really about um, undertaking important activities and promoting social cohesion, promoting the work of the European Commission and the European Union um, and solidarity. And the last project that we did, you might know, was our first podcast. Um, and that is available on our website. And that's a Learner Voice podcast. And then this one, um, as you can see here, Learning for Change. It's an adult learning and global citizenship, sustaining European cohesion and challenging the politics of fear. So basically within this project, what we're having is two separate sessions and that's around practical supports so that we're developing a handbook and this is pulled from the handbook different bits so that you guys can say, well, look, I really care about the issues that are mentioned in this project and I'd like to be able to go and work with my group of learners um, and walk straight in and here's activities and methodologies that I'll be able to use. So now, as I say, we're not experts in this field. We do not claim to be. But what we're trying to do is pull together um, different methods and different activities and different resources from different areas, which will all be referenced um, and just give people that opportunity to kind of engage in this topic and reflect on it, too. And at the same time, if you have anything at all, please do share. We'd love to share best practice um, and pull from your expertise as well, especially in the areas of like development, education, and social inclusion, anti-racism, etc. So the aim of the program is to address the politics of fear in Ireland and build social cohesion within communities. To identify the importance of Ireland's solidarity and collaboration in the European Union, to recognize false information or so-called fake news and the motives behind right-wing populist propaganda, 
discover the impact and contribution of vaccines on public health and the scientific methods and ethical procedures involved in their approval. Because as we know, it's a really big concern for a lot of people in the public at the moment that they have concerns over vaccines. Um, identify racism, discrimination, and the ne negative impact of othering. Discuss the impact and value of democracy and civic engagement in local communities, Irish society, and European cooperation. So the way that we've done this in the methodology handbook is to break that down into five learning units. So for example, there, the first objective is a learning unit. And then within that, that's broken down into more um, smaller learning objectives as well, connected back to the material and the materials obviously connected to different activities. So we've pulled different pieces. And today we're looking at things um, like democracy, fake news. Um, and then next week we'll be looking at um, anti-racism and critical thinking and we're hoping to have some expert speakers as well as part of that session and like that if there's anything at all today please don't hesitate to turn your mic on and come on and share something and um, ask questions I'll do my best <laughs> um, and we have three different um, we're not calling the breakout rooms today you know the first one is very fancy it's called a knowledge cafe <laughs> but we're having three different sessions where people get to work together um, and I think bring back some of the community because I think we all missed each other over Christmas um, and we're all sick of sitting in our own kitchens. So it's a time for people to say hello together um, and have that chance to come together again. So as I said, there will be the methodology handbook. We're in the final stages of that at the moment. Um, and But we still do have room for inclusion if there's something you want to send on and we'll present that next week. We are doing the workshops. So we're gonna do part A and part B this week and next week. And if anybody didn't get to make it today, of course they can come next week anyway. We'll also do one that's learner focused. Um, and actually we can do more than that. It's not a case of that we're only doing one. If you'd love us to come in and do a workshop with your learners, just send us an email, we'd be delighted to. Um, and then we've also created an amazing animated video addressing um, fake news. And I have to say, it was great fun. We came together in the Aintus team and we had loads of ideas. We thought we were all absolute geniuses, then realized loads of those ideas wouldn't work. Um, <laughs> but we came down to a final solution and we got some feedback and we've sent it out to learners as well and got their feedback. So that's also in the final stages. Emma has been absolutely fantastic, especially in the, in the leading of that piece of work. And uh, we'll be presenting that next week. So you can um, be our critical friends and let us know what you think and then share it, obviously. So what I'm going to do first is just go through some images. I want you to just kind of have time to process the images, take them in. Um, and then after that, we'll go into our rooms and have a discussion. But I think some of these images are a bit hard hitting. So take a moment to process them, as I said, and you know, be really open about how you feel about the images that you see and what it evokes in you, what concerns you have, what you'd like us as a sector to do to address these. Um, and this is what this project is all about, really. And even though it does have a time frame, it's something that we're going to continue to work on because obviously it's really important. So let us know what you want from us to be able to do that as well. The famous red bus, bringing us all shopping charges and delayed deliveries. Thanks, lads. <laughs> So obviously some really difficult um, messaging there, hard to take. And I think my aim there is really to help us feel that immersed, frustrated, kind of upset, saddened, angered, everything, all those emotions that you're feeling all the time with all these images, with all this really 
nasty messaging being thrown at people um, and the different feelings that come with that. Now, I know on the broader scale of things, we want to remember that that's a minority of people, that we are much bigger than that, that we have hope, that we have love, that we're working together, that we're working on communities, we're working on social cohesion um, and we're better than that. But I still think we need to take the time to digest that, that that is what's happening and it is very difficult. Um, and it's especially very difficult for many of our learners who are people from those groups who are being targeted with this negative imagery, these negative campaigns um, and what we can do to try and address that through the most powerful tool for social change, which is adult learning. <coughs> So our first methodology, excuse me, is the um, Knowledge Cafe. And the aims of the cafe include the surfacing of the group's collective knowledge, learning from each other, sharing ideas and insights, <coughs> excuse me, gaining a deeping understanding of a topic and the issues involved and exploring possibilities. It can also be used to help connect people, improve interpersonal relationships, break down organizational silos and improve trust and engagement. So we're gonna go into our Knowledge Cafe spaces, not our breakout rooms, <laughs> for about 15 minutes. And we're just going to have those really open and honest conversations. It's a reflective space um, to talk about the images that you've seen and other concerns or issues that you have, um, and maybe some of the experiences that are happening on the ground. Um, and then we'll come back together and we'll ask someone to share those. Now, if there's things that you want to talk about that you don't want fed back to the group, that's perfectly fine. This is not an outcomes-based activity. It's a reflective space. Um, so we shall, Barry is going to kindly put us into our separate tables within the cafe and then we'll come back together. Thanks, guys. Okay, Deborah, well, everyone should be getting the, the message there now to move into the rooms. So if they'd just like to accept, that'd be great. Um, okay, go on, I'll go ahead. Really, we just had um, an open conversation about the images we saw. We were talking about the fact that, like, for some of us, we were very lucky that we don't take notice um, or take in or feel take in the images and I suppose be swayed by some of the things that we've seen because we know that what is happening behind the scenes is them trying to anger people trying to give people false information uh, trying to sway people's votes say for example in an issue like Brexit or different elections and um, but we were fortunate in that and maybe some of the people that we work with or our own friends and family are not so fortunate um, and they might become vulnerable to believing things that we've seen. And we even mentioned how, say, within our own group, there's been times when we've even believed false information or maybe shared a hashtag, not realizing that that was actually connected to something that originally came from a hate group or white supremacy because you thought it was actually meant something positive. And that that's, it can be really challenging for people, especially when we think of things like social media, um, which is such a fast paced kind of explosive form of communication in many ways. Um, I'm trying to think, was there anything else that we were talking about? It was just really good conversation to be able to have those kind of open spaces about the topics anyway. And if anybody from my group had anything else to add, please do. I've probably forgotten loads. Um, does somebody from um, Laura's group want to come in? Hi, Deborah. Um, Aki's going to give the feedback for our group. If that's oh, okay. We weren't able to bully anyone else into doing it. <laughs> Yes, so I am the one. Um, so yeah, there were several interesting points uh, made. So one thing we, what raised was basically, you know, when we check whether information is actually misinformation or not, you know, there are a lot of good fact checking websites, but actually they are either American based or British based. And actually there isn't many uh, resources in, in terms of, you know, Ireland Irish context. So, you know, it, if there was some recommendation, if there was such a resource, that would be really useful. Uh, and then one, uh, one person uh, recommended a very good book uh, titled Responding to Racism Guide. Apparently, this is a very good source to think That's about. Great. Yeah. Um, then also one point raised was like, it's, it is sometimes hard, especially for tutors to, you know, to, to think about how to deal with the situations where you know some kind of you know inappropriate remarks took place in the classrooms it should mm -hmm. they deal with it immediately then but then the time for teaching would be you know used uh, or maybe it should be you know uh, put it off for the next class for further discussion or what would be the best way to deal with this kind of situation as a tutors? So these were the points uh, that came up in my in our uh, 
Yeah, that's brilliant, Jackie. And I'm just going to write that down because actually, and I won't get into it now, obviously, and I'm not saying I'm the most expert person, but maybe something that we could look at even including in that booklet or just in general on the Aintus website is helpful tips for being able to address situations like that. And obviously every situation is going to be different, but there might be things that the person in that situation can consider before they take their next step. And maybe we can build on the expertise of the people in this group as well to help that because it is hard. And when you're, you know, you're responsible for a group of people in the room and for their safety and that safety um, can unfortunately sometimes lead into areas of discrimination um, and people's mental health. So it's how to how you can responsibly do that while protecting yourself and making sure that you're doing it in a professional capacity. And it's not an easy thing to do. So maybe that's something that we can kind of look at as a collective as well and try and, and help people with. Um, brilliant. Thank you so much, Aki. Um, Sam, did you have another group? Uh, yeah, if anyone from from our group would like to jump in, you can you can go for it. Otherwise, I did scribble down a few notes. Feel free to jump in anyway. But what I'll do is I'll go ahead because we had lots of really really good points, incredible insights. Uh, to be honest, and I can't, I won't get to them all. But um, we talked a little bit at the beginning about fear of vaccines, uh, and how difficult it is when you already have a sense of say, like a healthy level of skepticism generally. And then if you sprinkle in a bit of misinformation and how, how difficult that can then be um, on an individual kind of level. Um, and I think Aaron had a good comment there. I agree if he doesn't mind me uh, quoting him about the, uh, he said, it's like we have the salmon of knowledge at our fingertips <laughs> in terms of our mobile phones and devices, but not everyone has the kind of, I suppose, the, the critical capacity or critical thinking capacity always, all the time. Um, to make sure that we digest and we interpret and analyze that information um, in a healthy kind of truthful way. Um, so it's, I mean, social media was, was pointed out how dangerous it can be. Um, but at the same time, it also holds massive potential for good. It keeps us connected uh, and where there's, there's truth and knowledge, it empowers us. I thought that was, that was very important as well. And, and the last thing I'll just say is I thought it was really, really good, uh, really interesting to hear people talk about the value and the role of adult education in this whole area, because it does provide direct experience on an everyday level um, with, with people who come from some of the groups that were kind of demonized in those images that we first saw. Uh, and it creates a kind of a, a safe uh, space and a positive space for intercultural uh, experiences and direct experience to increase and enhance social integration uh, and inclusion. And I think that is something that, that we should all uh, really, really keep in mind. So thanks to my group. And if, if anyone has any other comments, please, please jump in. Thanks, Sterva. Thanks so much, Sam. Aaron, were you gonna come in there? No? Oh, I thought you were waving. <laughs> Saying well done, fair play. Um, yeah, thanks so much, Sam. And even one of the things you said there, is really important as well. I'm thinking, you know, about trying to have that positive mindset too, because quite often with this stuff, we can feel a bit overwhelmed by the negativity and we forget the positives and, and the hope. And it's even remembering the fact that, like, you, as you said, social media tools and the internet, although there can be such this onslaught um, of negative and false information, but at the same time, for the first time in uh, how, however even, they've given people from... Uh, vulnerable and marginalized backgrounds, people who didn't have a platform, um, a direct space to be able to share their experience, to be able to spread truth, articulate their own um, lived experiences, and to be able to create spaces for communities to come together and advocate for their needs. And I think like that has to be celebrated as well. And that's amazing. Um, and mm -hmm. you know, you only have to go on Twitter to see lived experiences, even from members of the traveler community, and um, being able to come in and speak about an issue that's relevant in the news that day. And that's fantastic. Um, so yeah, it's trying to remember the good as well, I suppose, isn't it? Uh, thanks so much, Sam. Um, Kalyan, are you there? I feel like I'm radioing into people or someone from Kalyan's group. <laughs> I am here. It's like we spoke until like the very last second. So I might take a leaf out of Sam's book and go ahead. And if anyone feels like I'm misrepresenting them, I don't want to be a, a fake newsmonger myself for my own group. So if I miss anything, please do chime in. <coughs> yes, I guess we started talking about maybe, first of all, the kind of challenges to teaching about a lot of those the resources we're going to be covering. I know we talked a little bit about there are like very clear teach like teachings or lessons you can give about discrimination and the legal background to that and how it is actually illegal. But then how the actual changing mind process is a much more is trickier because obviously you can't force someone to change their mind. You can't force someone to have a different opinion. So it's how do you 
combine those two things for a really effective way of like challenging people and changing their minds. We then came back to the images a little bit and we were talking about kind of like the ways in which they're affected and kind of like there's a real lack of empathy around these images and kind of like we we're talking about the kind of like what would you do response to these where most people obviously these images are used to create fear and stuff but if you were to look at them and try and like place yourself in them you would have such a different attitude to them and how do we kind of you know how like what's that process from going immediately to kind of like a fear or anger and then we kind of circled back to kind of again looking at challenging misinformation I know some of the <laughs> in the group were talking about um kind of people they know in their personal lives who have like would have like, kind of bought into very difficult um, opinions and stuff about vaccines and how I think that kind of resonates with a lot of people these days. I think a lot of us know someone who may have bought into something like this now and kind of like, what's the best way to approach this? And kind of like, I'd like these days, a lot of conspiracy theories, a lot of people do have a lot of knowledge as it were to back it up and um, because there's so much information out there and that the issue really is, is kind of how to challenge that A through critical thinking, but also how to do it in a very non-confrontational manner and how not to kind of you know, be condescending or just be like, no, that's objectively wrong because that's just not how change happens. So yeah, kind of looking, and then we finally came back to again, adult ed, how it can be used to encourage mm -hmm. critical thinking and unconfrontational discussion to kind of mitigate these kind of issues. Thanks so much, Kellyanne. That's excellent. And yeah, the same. I think I'm definitely one of those guilty people who's straight up direct, like, I disagree with you. That's racist. <laughs> but for us to be able to get those people on side, as you say, mm -hmm. you can't always be confrontational and you can't always say, this is right, this is wrong, even though we believe it in our hearts and, and we know certain elements of things to be true, but you have to be able to understand where coming, someone's coming from and listen to them. Um, and I think maybe that's something we all need to work towards as well as trying to be able to understand that space um, and listen to others, but it, it's not easy. And as you say, it happens in your own friends and your own family. I've personally taken my mother up on a couple of things that she shared on Facebook uh, that I was saying in my group as well. So yeah, we all have it, I think. Um, Katie, did you have a group as well? Yeah, I did. And just, I think this is just a fantastic space for peer learning. I know I've learned a load from my group as well. So thanks to everybody who contributed. Many of the same kind of um, issues or comments had come up in terms of, uh, what we were talking about. I know Sharon was saying, you know, a lot of those images, it's groups of people together and there's no one kind of individualized and it's kind of that kind of, I guess, everybody uh, together and how emotive they can be. And I know Fergus was saying as well of just how sophisticated everything is, you know, in terms of the look and marketing and all around a lot of that kind of fake news. And that can be a real challenge. Um, Siobhan and Cloda from CDETB actually gave um, some examples of resources. I know there was a Finnish resource that they were talking about um, to kind of, that looks at a checklist of what you can be looking at in terms of it, I think will be useful for all of us when we're reading through um, different things. And I know Fergus is looking at um, setting up an active citizenship course. So I think this uh, next two parts and also with the membership can provide an opportunity to look at different groups that have actually been running active citizenship programs Kalyan was talking there around, um, you know, some of the challenges of trying to change people's minds and that definitely came up because we were talking, I was talking about the um, animation and how difficult it was around language messaging. Um, and I think it is about empowering adult learners and not telling people what to do because we don't want to just be saying, well, that's wrong, that's right. And that's something that we debated a lot, I know, within the staff team. Um, so a lot of it is just getting people to kind of question but also what resources to go to and then issue if there is media literacy or there, there's an access issue to all of these kind of different areas that if social media is your only source um, of news then that can be highly challenging. So I think it, it, it is just looking at how to kind of put this together and I think there's definitely a need for within this booklet as well for different resources checklists to be sharing um, different resources but also if somebody has run a really successful active citizenship campaign or media literacy we could look to be kind of a vehicle to share that information uh, with people because it, it is really important that the right approach is taken the right language that it's done within the ethos and I'm, when it's quite emotive that can be difficult to do and obviously it, it deeply affects people in terms of some of the issues um, I know there was lots more but I think just to kind of that they were kind of the main issues um, and so I definitely think just looking at the different resources um, and yeah, just practical steps, I guess, um, that people can take when they're, they're, they're bringing this back to learners and just trying to, to, to kind of, I guess, empower change. Thank, that's fantastic, Katie. And I think, yeah, 
a hundred percent if anybody wants to send us any materials please do because we will put them in the booklet and um, it's not too late like that checklist from cdetb the course on active citizenship anything else and um, everything will obviously be referenced you know and if it's something from your center that you've developed or wherever it's from we'll make sure that that's very clear but this is just about us bringing all of the best practice and information and support we can together in one space to give it back to you and um, so it's 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 um it's just about trying to improve the situation for all of us, and that's fantastic to hear that there's so much going on. It's brilliant. And um, we're going to go back into the slides if I can manage to do that now. <laughs> um, there we go. So as you can see, yeah, that was just the first example of a methodology to use the Knowledge Cafe, and I think as you can see, you know, those conversational pieces are really important. And the one aspect there that I think that should be remembered for keeping that. Um, positivity and less pressure maybe is not to have any planned aims so sometimes when we're going into spaces we're going okay well what can we come out of this with you need to just have no planned aim so that people feel like I'm just going to talk about whatever I want to talk about um, and have that space to do that so I think it's it's a really good and I think it could go on for longer and it's tough also to say if you're trying to get your peer-to-peer -peer learning going on again while you're on zoom it's something that you could do there give them a topic um, and send people in and it's fantastic so one of the other units in the handbook um, is looking at the area of false information. So it's recognizing false information or so-called fake news and the motives behind right-wing populist propaganda. Now, obviously, um, populism can be used across different spectrums in the political sphere um, and behind many different campaigns for many different issues. But as we know, you know, the conservative right-wing um, agenda at the moment has been very concerning and it has led to things um like you know um more racism in the area and um, trump selection there's so many there's too many there's things in ireland as well there's too many things unfortunately to even try and list them all but there's a lot going on um but i think that this is really relevant even in terms of the terms that are used um, and i was learning from this as well when we were trying to pull the information together so just to go through them there um, disinformation. So that's information that is false and deliberately created to harm a person, social group, organization or country. So, for example, the slogans, the images that you would have seen before, many of them, like one of the things in Brexit was 77 million Turkish people will arrive on the shores of Britain if we if we don't leave Europe. I don't even think there is 77 million people in Turkey altogether. Um, and who maybe they don't want to go to Britain. <laughs> Do you know what I mean, though? Like there's all this... Uh, uh, false information is being shared there or disinformation if it's being created with a purpose to deliberately cause harm and um, misinformation so that's information that is false but not created with the intention of causing harm and um, so people make mistakes sometimes people just share inaccurate information and um, and it's also always good to check but that can happen too and then malinformation is information that is based on reality used to inflict harm on a person social group organization or country so there's different specific types now one organization that is absolutely fantastic in this area is media literacy ireland and um, do look them up we'll also have a link to them in the handbook and um, they have they run campaigns throughout the year they have a network so that's a collective and we're a member of that as well of different groups in irish society that have come together to address these sorts of issues and they provide fantastic workshops um, that are free to attend on loads of different topics around media literacy. Um, and it's attended, it's really interesting too, because it's attended by people like ourselves, but also you know, professionals in radio, professional in um, newspapers and in, in different forms of print media. So it's a great way to meet those people as well and learn from them um, and hear their concerns as journalists about what's happening at the moment and maybe with the spread of um, I'm now which form is it disinformation misinformation and malinformation online through social media and um, and then so we're going into um looking at this in in breakout rooms too to have kind of a go of, of addressing fake news and um, in a moment and then that's going to be really interesting but one of the things i wanted to look at too was have you noticed on the right hand see at the right hand side of my screen um here you can see this was actually a pop-up box. So when I was creating this presentation and I was writing about things like the coronavirus, it popped up to give me um, a so-called accurate information, kind of news output from the World Health Organization or I presume the Irish government as well. Um, I wonder have other people seen that? Maybe you can write it in the chat box. It actually happens all the time on Instagram as well. So I'd be um, a social media um, addict <laughs> constantly on um 
on Instagram and if you ever mention anything to do with COVID-19, you now get a message. It's only happened in the last while, but you now get a message. And Twitter, actually, I think it happens as well, <coughs> to let you know about accurate information and where you can read about it, which I think is fantastic. So that's really good. And I think some of this information here as well is something that we were already talking about in our groups. The internet has created new ways to share and consume information. So that both has positive, positive and negative outcomes. Fake news is often used to spread misinformation by groups or people such as immigrants or refugees. And um, political events such as elections or the COVID-19 pandemic can also become targets of those creating malinformation. And I'm gonna give you a really clear example of that at the end of the workshop. Um, and then social media is often the place when people receive information often from family or friends, which can make it difficult to figure out what's credible or reliable information. And that is really hard because who are the people that you trust the most? Generally, it's your family. Generally, it's your close friends. And um, so if someone like, say, your cousin or your auntie tells you a story about a situation or gives you a supposed fact, you probably are going to assume that it's true or many people would. Um, and it's hard to tell people not to believe their own family, but we're, we're trying to give them, I suppose, more tools to have that critical thinking and those open conversations um, that just are looking for more accurate information. So one of the example activities that we've put in the handbook for people to use is a learner project. It's called Investigating the Truth. And really it's about giving people that opportunity to be able to go away and undertake a piece of work and come back together um, and frame it in, in the format of a project. So you're organizing learners into pairs or small groups, asking learners to develop a project that explores the topic of fake news and investigate two new stories, one conspiracy or propaganda story. Um, learners are asked to research the concept of fake news, discuss the dangers of conservative populist narratives and the impact this can have on communities, groups and society or individuals. And this can include malinformation, how it's used to drive fear and create misconceptions about different people and vulnerable groups. Now, I know that's not in plain English. So there is an element of this where there will be the need for the tutor to explain parts of it. But in the handbook, we also have the steps that learners are asked to follow and then also further instruction notes but please do, if you think there's anything there that you think we should add or explain further, please do let us know so we can amend those before we create the final project, um, product, can't speak, <laughs> um, because that feedback would be fantastic. So then the next thing is we're gonna look at the bad news game. So what we're asking people to do is to go into uh, breakout rooms again, but this time you're gonna have a go playing the game with your facilitator, which should be good fun. Um, some of you may have come across this uh, before. It's um, it's quite funny um, and scary. <laughs> but what we're gonna do is the facilitator is going to share their screen and play the game and you're going to give input on what step they should take next and see the results. If by any chance we're having IT issues, maybe people can play it on their phone in the breakout rooms and have a conversation about that. That can just be our backup plan. Um, so Barry, if you could put us into breakout rooms, but give us a really strict 10 minutes this time and um, just to, we'd have to cut a bit of time off. No, I'm not blaming you. We had, um, cause we had 15 minutes last time. Um, oh, then yeah, we can make sure we come back. Yeah. Uh, cause I know we're having good conversations as well. Is that okay? Is everybody still with us? We're all right. Yeah. So at about uh, six minutes past, yep. no pressure, six months <laughs> past, uh, we were another minute more. Uh, we'd all be back in the, the main room. So Barry and I were just saying it'd be mad crack if we're all standing around having a cup of tea together in actual person, <laughs> hugging people. We miss you. Um, sorry, a bit crazy. Uh, so I hope that went well. This time what we're going to do is just keep the feedback really short so we have time to do the next session as well. So maybe like a one minute max uh, feedback on the game and um, bit of crack you had. And if it's less, that's no problem. Um, so maybe we'll go to Kellyanne first. Hello, yes, I'll be really quickly. Um, my group was saying we were almost too good at the game. Like we really took to it like a duck to water. But yeah, I forget what you're saying. It's, we found it interesting how they, one of the last points made actually how like the fake news can be left wing or right wing. Oftentimes it doesn't really matter as long as it's like, as long as it's there to fear and anger someone. And yeah, okay. so we got through the impersonation and the um, emotional sections of the game. And yeah, I guess the emotional part was really interesting because it's all about, you know, like, it's sometimes often the message isn't important it's more the scary words and the kind of impact that it has so yeah we got 396 followers as well so I was weirdly proud about yes that. that's the danger of it though isn't it yeah I was saying that to Barry I was like you can see how people end up going off and just loving it and keep going you know forget your morals <laughs> um Aki do you want to go next yeah uh so we and I suppose we enjoyed the game or we kind of 
found it interesting. And the one the, uh, I want to share two comments. One is, you know, how easy it can be to get credibility by, you know, faking someone's account, famous account and then <laughs> spread the misinformation, this information. And also people, maybe if people are, you know, kind of feel excluded from the you know, society in everyday life, they may be more vulnerable to this kind of, you know, strategy or, you know, um, temptation. And in, in this sense, you know, in, for, you know, the adult education is important to keep these, you know, so-called marginalized people, you know, keep uh, being included into our community and the society. That was the kind of points. Definitely. And that's the preventative measures. Yeah. Make sure people do feel included. Um, 100%. Thanks, Aki. Um, Laura? Thanks, Derval. Um, yeah, just very briefly, I, I don't remember what our final follower count uh, was, but I know it was lower than, than Kalyan's group. Um, but, uh, Mary, <laughs> She's uh, loving that now. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was anyway. Uh, someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, we enjoyed playing the game and um, one of, the, one of the great points made was by Mary about um, how, you know, playing to people's emotions and sharing deliberately provocative, outrageous content is a business model. Mm. And it's a very successful business model. So it's important to bear that in mind, you know, that the objective is to is to sell and gain followers when emotions are being played to um, in, in such a manner. So thanks. Definitely. Thanks so much, Laura. And I think we've even, you know, become more critical of the fact that even Irish charities have used elements of those things to be able to gain income um, by portraying images of people, you know, in different areas of the world to get um, mm. sympathy for them. And that's obviously led to negative mindsets or, or different thoughts around different communities as well that we need to be careful of, but we'll come back to more of that next week. Katie, do you have um, feedback? I'm looking around because I can't yeah, see anybody. Great <laughs> uh, we were yeah. a bit slow to take off and that was my fault because I couldn't quite figure out what we were actually trying to achieve. I knew the follower thing. Seriously impressed with my group and they knew all of the ways of getting, you know, the motive. We got 351 in the end. We were going hell for leather to try and get up the followers. I think, you know, it's really interesting to see. It's a brilliant game in terms of showing that emotive piece, personating, like what Aki was saying. Um, we had two badges, so we got the um, personation and the emotion. Uh, so really interesting and I guess just a, a fun activity to bring people together, but also a lot of learning from it in terms of what uh, people are actually using. And even though we, we clicked one of the wrong things, but someone was like, that would have been clickbait if we chose that. <laughs> particular uh, piece and we, we were kind of thinking too far outside the box so uh a bit of Real fun strategies so learning as well so yeah really good oh brilliant thanks katie sam yeah and again if any of the group aaron or Bree or Emer want to jump in like i i have to i'll apologize straight away i was very slow on the clicker to to get us to get us to where we needed to be i'm really shocked you have less than 10 followers we, sam. Only, we only had around two i think it was 238 maybe that's not embarrassing that's okay we'll we let you wait 238 so, uh, no sam it was pretty awesome it was the <laughs> last little meme you made. first i will say you were very slow you were deliberately <laughs> I, anyway, I'll, I'll be quiet right, carry on <laughs> yeah, I may, might have hesitated a bit too long. He's a processor, Aaron is our Sam. He's a processor. <laughs> <laughs> but this it was, is where it, it comes was, out that there's actually been a there's a book being running on this. <laughs> I think you can <laughs> notice the competitive nature Power or, or, or other betting institutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but it was good. We went to the dark side of things very easily and quickly, and, and weaponizing emotion was was uh, yeah. We, we we're starting to get good at it. I'll put it that way. <laughs> But you can see, isn't it? You could see how people would be pulled in. Like, especially, well, I don't know, that's terrible. I was going to say, especially young people, that's really unfair. I think anybody of any age might get pulled in and see it as a game and not think about the serious consequences before they've got themselves a bit in too deep. But it's great crack. And I think it's a really good tool to use with learners and with family and friends uh, just to explore the concepts of fake news. Um, okay, we're going to jump back into our presentation. There we go. Can everybody see that? Present. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so then the last section is just looking at this really um, fascinating article that Sam sent my way. Um, and I told him he had to check the credibility of it after everything talking about false news, but it had a lot of references as well. Um, is our democracy under threat? So this is a really fascinating piece and it actually reminded me of one of those Media Literacy Ireland events that I went back to before and I learned the concept of dark ads 
um, and micro targeting that I'd never heard of before. And I suppose just to say what a dark ad is, and I hope I get this correct now, um, during things like the abortion um, referendum, the repeal campaign, um, there were ads that were circulated for either group, depending on, as because as Kellyanne made a good point, you know, you can target uh, people on either side of the political sphere or in the middle. Um, and basically, if they targeted you and they realized that you had a certain mindset and they knew that they were probably going to be able to influence you with certain images, they would create dark ads and they could fill that with false information. Um, and within that, nobody else would see that. So for example, they would only send those really hard hitting false information based ads to people that they knew were vulnerable to it or they suspected were based on their profile online. Um, and if they knew that someone, just say, for example, if it was me, that I was less likely to believe that, I wouldn't see that ad on Facebook. So I couldn't report it or highlight the fact that it was false information. So it was really, really dangerous and um, sneaky campaigning. Um, and it's happening, you know, in all forms of um, elections um, and referendums all over the world, I'm sure. So this was a piece that's available. Um, actually, I'll put the link into the chat box in, in a few minutes. Um, Alexander Nick, CEO of Cambridge Analytica, along with its vice president, Steve Bannon, the chief executive of Donald Trump's 2016 presidential campaign, received 15 million to develop software such as micro targets um, for voters from Robert, Robert Mercer, a billionaire uh, US hedge fund manager. Micro-targeting means transmitting a message to a subgroup of the electorate on the basis of unique information about the subgroup. So this is a really long, elaborate way that they basically created a massive um, burst of energy to be able to influence the Leave campaign in Brexit is what the next part of this article goes on to explain. And I'm going to show you a video, but it's worth reading the article. And it's quite scary, the things that they can do. But basically, they're using things like um, even competition. So one area that they did was they put out a, a football competition and they the statistics of you actually winning were like it, was, it wasn't going to happen but based on your profile you had to give your Facebook information to be able to access this and when you did that they took in everything about you they they targeted um your mannerisms the language you used what you liked what you didn't like on the internet and then they put you into different groups to be able to influence you for the election um so it's madness. And they did that in loads of different ways. And that as was connected to the Facebook um, court case that you saw where um, they got in trouble for having their, for sharing information, selling information, having information hacked. But there's, it's, it's happening, um, these big businesses and there's some of the same people in power who are doing this behind the scenes. So I'm going to attempt to share this and let me know if you can't hear it. It's only a short video. In 2016, the UK's EU referendum was hacked, but how? I'll show you in 60 seconds. First, you need to access data on people. 87 million Facebook user profiles were stolen and sold to Cambridge Analytica, as Mark Zuckerberg testified to Congress in 2018. Next, you need to find out their voting intentions. Vote Leave used a questionnaire in a football competition that was impossible to win. People psychologically profiled to vote Remain were placed on an ignore list. The others were sent the same simple message over and over again. Turkey, 76 million immigrants, 350 million pounds, NHS, fear, blogs, ads, and leave.eu fake news. All the time the AI algorithm was refining the voters that will be most easy to influence, the most receptive. In the final days and hours, 1.5 billion Facebook ads were sent to the voters deemed the easiest to manipulate over a few days, and it worked. Over 17 million people voted leave, 3 million that never voted before. People who had no idea about the EU economy or how much we sell to Europe. That's how you hack a referendum in 60 seconds. So obviously that's a lot of information to take in in a minute, <laughs> but I, I recommend watching it. As I said, I'll share the link um, and maybe Sam, you might have access to it there in the meantime, you could. Um, so this is another um, activity that's within the handbook as well called activism and agency. So to organize learners into triads, which is groups of three, each group must identify a cause they wish to advocate for and develop a campaign plan. Learners should consider the needs of diverse stakeholders and methods for ensuring voices are heard, the values underpinning their campaign, an evidence base for their ask recommendations, developing an advocacy and campaign strategy, their plan of action and roles within the team, and then the launch of their campaign. And I think like connected to that, there's an activity connected to the video and the article you've just seen, 
but it's really about raising people's awareness of the fact that this stuff does go on behind the scenes. Um, now, the other positive thing to say is even with all of that going on, the Leave campaign actually only won by a narrow enough margin. Now, I could be corrected on that because I got my statistics thrown back at me there about the Turkish. <laughs> uh, thankfully, thanks to someone else in the team. But it is one of those things where even though the author behind this who's done the work at the end of the article was very much like, let's not lose hope. Let's remember that we can come together, that we can create change. Um, and that also when you see these negative images, it is a smaller group of people who are doing this for power, for money or for whatever reason. Um, but hopefully we have to remember that the majority of people don't feel that way. Um, and with an open conversation and, and learning and, and sharing knowledge, um, they, they won't hopefully feel that way afterwards for some people. So that's really positive. Um, so what we're going to do is potentially, and I'm wondering on time now, I was going to say we could go into another breakout room and have a go at this activity and then come back and have a discussion, but people might be pushed on time because it's nearly 20 past three. So what I might do is stop sharing for a second um, and see what people think. If anybody wants to come on, would you like to go into the rooms or do you want to open up the floor to discussion around um, what you've seen today? And then what I was going to ask is, is there any other resources that people have or anything that you'd like to flag that you'd like us to address in the handbook? Um, or any concerns you have or any general feedback. Or would you like to go in and have a go at developing the campaign? No, I, I don't think we have time to go into developing the campaign. Grant, thank you. Um, so do you have any general feedback? Is there anything that jumps out at you that you think should be included in the handbook or that we should explore in the next session? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I sorry, can I, I just... handbook there first or handbook instead of hand up? Look at me. <laughs> Were you going to come in there? Rachel? Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I have a little bit of concern about um, the use of the phrase fake news. Um, because it is so often used by Trump, for example, um, and that is how it originated. And it's so often used by people who actually believe in. Um, Again, I have a problem with the idea of conspiracy theories. I think it's conspiracy narratives. It might be more useful and I'll go back to that in a second. But just um, just because I think maybe it's, I, I, my preference anyway is to use misinformation, disinformation, to be more specific about it rather than yeah. a, a kind of a blanket, it's fake news because then you get into, no, mine's fake news, no, yours is fake news, you, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, I no, that's that really helpful. And maybe that's something to be addressed in the handbook because I think, a lot of people use the term fake news, so you're able to um, draw people into the type of conversation that you want to have around that, but maybe it needs to be very clear on terms of the fact that that's not the appropriate uh -huh. term. These are the appropriate terms. Do you think uh -huh. that would be okay? I think so, yeah. I just, I'm just i just a bit wary of it, that, that's all. No, that's um, good, it's good to have that feedback. Okay, and the other thing is just on the, the conspiracy theory, and the reason why I have a problem with using the word theory there is because it conflates my crazy notion with a scientific theory, which is a completely different thing. And, you know, people will say, well, you know, creationism is a theory too, not in the sense of a, th a scientific theory, which has to be backed by evidence, which has to be, um, which has to be falsifiable, you know? So I, I just, m my own preference is not to use the word theory in that context because of that. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Jericho, I have a bit of an alarm bell ringing and I hate to bring this up, but, there seems to be even written into the funding call or to the aim of this booklet to combat right-wing propaganda. Mm -hmm. Now, for me, the aim would surely be to combat fake news and to, 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 to push critical thinking, etc. And the reason I say that is that anybody who knows anything about social media yeah. or conspiracy theories is they're all about in-groups for good and for bad. They're for about creating an in-group. And the worst thing you can do if you're trying to disabuse somebody of a false belief is to tell them out, we're, you're wrong and we're trying to, you know, we're showing you the error of your ways because that yeah. will just encourage people back into their silos. Yeah. So I don't know if on the preface to your booklet, which the learners will see is we're doing this because that is in itself a political ideology that you're pushing. Yeah. You know, and I yeah. find it frightening in a way. I mean, I hate having to say this, but I- No, you're right though. But Emer, that's like, it's, a, it's honest feedback and it's good. And as I said at the start, 
we're not experts in this area. This is something where we're trying to address different issues, bring people together and offer resources. Um, and there's going to be weaknesses in that because we're not, we don't have expertise in this. And that's why it's really important to have those honest uh, conversations and that it, feedback it, from the likes of yourself. And I'd love you to share more of your expertise on that. That's brilliant. It's just, it, 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 for me, it's, it, it'll always succeed better if it's entirely neutral, because if you are yeah. basically setting up a reason not to believe this to somebody who does have the opinion or the ideas you're trying to basically clear up. Yeah. No. No, that's great. Thank you, Emer. Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, Rachel, are you gonna come in? Yeah, just um on that sort of on the same area, but I think there there are some things that are kind of pretty incontrovertible and uh, and going back to the question of when something comes up in, in class and if somebody makes it, you know, an out and out uh, racist remark or um, if, if somebody, let's say, if somebody were to claim the earth is flat, we, we would have no difficulty saying, uh, well, you know, I think it's kind of been fairly well proven that the earth is round. Um, and, and we wouldn't need to go too far into the science. So there's a slight danger. I can't remember. I read a really good article recently. I can't remember, was it Rebecca Sonnet or Margaret Atwood or somebody was just saying, if you pander to people, you know, if there are things that are incontrovertible, like, you know, there's, there's racism is just not good. Um, you know, you nobody, 95% of scientists now believe that global warming is, is real. You know, you start always listening to people and saying, well, I understand your point. Yes, and you might, you could sort of think if you stand and you're looking at the sea, you think maybe the earth is flat and we're just standing on a plate. Um, but, and and you might have a point there, um, but you know, you can't, you know, there, there are certain things where we have to be able to say the, you know, this, the science is really pretty clear yeah. on this or the law is pretty clear on this and you can't go coming somebody you know, unforgivable names. So, yeah, you know, we, we have to listen. And the whole ethos of adult education is that we listen and we listen to the other point of view. But I do think we have to be able to have, and maybe we need more more tips on how to be assertive about things that are incontrovertible, whether they're left wing, right wing, or otherwise. It could be, you know, uh, no potatoes are um, are not. Um, I don't know. Uh, Skeety does not grow on trees. You know. Yeah, no, I, uh, yeah, definitely. But then you need to be very careful with that because one of the nine grounds, which I've always had a problem with, is on the grounds of religion because, you know, your man in the sky, if you believe in a man in the sky, it means that the other person's man in the sky is wrong. And for you, that is incontrovertible fact. So I think, I, unless, no, but what I'm trying to say is that you need to be entirely neutral and entirely sure of your facts. And you also need to question whether it is the role of your class in whatever it is for you to set somebody right on this. But I think the important thing is that you help and basically train people in critical thinking and kind of leave it at that without pushing an ideology with it. Can I? Can I, I mean, I, 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 was gonna I don't say, think anybody. I, I agree. Is there, and, yeah. yeah. And is there anybody yeah. who hasn't yeah. spoken yet who'd like to come in? Sorry. Was that Pauline? Were you going to say something? Yes, yeah, sorry. No, I, I I agree with that idea of um, training people in critical thinking, um, you know, as broadly as possible, um, just in being able to see um, several sides of the of the story, um, and I suppose yeah, drawing in the um, the facts of the case, you know, or indeed opinions that are supported, you know, supported um, um, by facts or by experience or so on. Um, and yeah, I guess not to, not to have an, a, a, yeah, an agenda, I suppose, a, a preset agenda um, for, for learners or, or if there is one, you know, that it would be, that it would be clear. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pauline. Does anybody yeah. else want to come in? I know it is a very challenging area and there's a lot of very sensitive issues. And I think that that is, it's difficult for people. And I suppose, and to outline that, that like, this is something about bringing together people about, you know, respect and hope and love and compassion and understanding and solidarity. And it, you know, we're, we're trying to find the best way forward in that. Um, 
and that can be a challenge. Sorry, do I see, see the ETB staff? Did, yeah, yeah, you wanted to come in? Yeah, just I just put it in the chat there. Just I'm thinking I just I'd like to echo Emma actually. I did they just flagged a little thing during the thing and then I but um and I forgot about it. But that actually when you were talking, you were saying that um Daryl, you were saying you're pointing out that the left wing can do it as well. Anybody can do it. But I'm just thinking of a particular group I'm working with where one of the students has what we would probably call right wing opinions. And he has firmly I mean, some of his opinions are based on his religious views. So yeah. uh, he would be um he doesn't think that you know he thinks that homosexuality is is wrong and so on, um, and being a lesbian teacher. But anyway, um, <laughs> but but I I want to be able to help him to think critically without sort of labelling him right wing or saying right wing is bad because do you know what I mean? It's I know it's it's complicated because even though yeah. if he has homophobic views, they're harmful to other people. Hands up, brother yes. lesbian. <laughs> yeah. But at yeah. the same time we have to be able to do that in a respectful way that doesn't further anger someone, but it has to be safe and respectful to other people. And, yes, and yes. it is, it's, yeah. yeah. Like, I think we can even see from the different, like, it's a really challenging area and it's something that we're only really, like, you know, we're starting to address. We have a lot of issues in Ireland in our history. I think from recent events that we can see that are coming to light that people have hidden. And I think it's something that is, it's difficult for all of us because I think none of us in this room can ever say that we've never had a negative or biased thought against someone else. We all need to be much more critical of our own behavior, our own beliefs, our own values, um, and being open and aware of our own privilege in all of that um, and mindful of supporting others. And we need to go through an uncomfortable journey to be able to come out the other side of that and continue to learn. Um, and I hope that this can be part of that conversation, but like I've already learned so much from the feedback you guys are given. There's so much more that we need to learn. So I hope that next week we can come back, have more of these really interesting conversations. And I suppose it's a good time to share that Aintas are also developing um, a space where we want to be able to bring people together and invite experts in looking at an anti-racism and um, social justice forum where we would work in partnership with other NGOs and other experts and academics to be able to create a space like this that's for reflection and for learning and to give people from different groups within society and um, that space to share their experience um, and to be able to do that because we do think it's really important and we think that the adult learning sector is such a powerful uh, place to be able to create um, this learning and this vehicle for social change so thank you so much to everybody for coming today I hope that you have found something beneficial from it and um, thank you for your feedback thank you so much for your engagement it's been fantastic and um, please do email us get in touch with us in and um, you send you can send more messages in, in the chat there and um, and we we'll look forward to seeing you next week hopefully and if you have anything that you'd like us to share and um, or if you'd like to even speak next week as well and um, sure let us know Thank you so much and have a lovely afternoon. Thank you.